The philosopher most widely regarded as the greatest who has ever written in the English language is David Hume, not an Englishman, but a Scot, born in Edinburgh in the year 1711. He did some of his best work very young. At about 18, he experienced a sort of intellectual revelation, and over the next eight years, he produced a large and revolutionary book called A Treatise of Human Nature. It met with little attention and even less understanding. In his own phrase, it fell dead born from the press. So in his 30s, he tried to rewrite that book in what he hoped would be a more popular form. This resulted in two smaller volumes, one called An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding and one called An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. But these were scarcely any better received and he gave the impression then of turning away from philosophy. In his 40s, he wrote A History of Great Britain, which for a hundred years was the standard work. That's why he's still sometimes categorized in libraries and books of reference as David Hume Historian. In his own lifetime, he made his reputation too as an economist, and his monetary theories have been re-attracting attention recently. He was even, in a modest way, a man of affairs. In the War of the Austrian Succession, he served as a staff officer on two military expeditions, and for a couple of years, in his early 50s, he was secretary to the British Embassy in Paris, and then, after that, Under Secretary of State in London. In all the many different circles in which he moved, he was popular for his good nature as much as for his genius. Such was his gift for friendship that he almost brought off the impossible task of befriending his French contemporary philosopher Rousseau, who at one time actually proposed making his home in Britain because Hume was there. In France, Hume was known as Le Bon David, and in his native Edinburgh, the street in which he lived was, and is, named after him St. David Street. In view of the latter point, it's perhaps ironical that in secret he'd been writing his final philosophical masterpiece, a profound and damaging critique of natural religion, which didn't come to light until after his death. He died in 1776, and in 1779 his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion were published. Some people consider it his best work. He's an unusually attractive figure who should also be seen as part of that great flowering of intellectual life in Edinburgh in the 18th century, which we now refer to as the Scottish Enlightenment. In David Hume, Adam Smith and James Boswell, the Scottish Enlightenment produced the English language's foremost philosopher, economist and biographer and they all knew each other. Adam Smith was one of Hume's closest friends and was greatly influenced by him. Boswell contemplated writing Hume's biography, though, alas, he never did. There's now a substantial literature on Hume, and one of the best books in it, Hume's Intentions, was written by the person who is with me now to discuss his work, Professor John Passmore of the Australian National University in Canberra. Professor Passmore, whenever Hume uh, gave a shorter exposition of his own philosophy, which he in fact two or three times did, he always put fundamental emphasis on what he had to say about causality. That is to say, what it is for one state of affairs to bring about or cause another state of affairs. The idea being that causality, this cause and effect relationship, is what binds together the whole of our known world. And he thought that what he had to say about that was the cornerstone of his philosophy. And in fact, it would be true to say that he, it's what he's best known for today. Can you tell us what the nub of his argument on that was? I think I'll try to by means of a practical example. Suppose a small child whose parents have always given it soft cotton toys has had soft cotton dolls, soft cotton dogs, so on and so on. Everything's soft cotton. One day somebody gives it a rubber ball. The child drops the rubber ball over the side of the bed and the next thing he notices is the rubber ball bounces. Nothing else in his experience has ever bounced before and here's this ball that begins bouncing. Now the first thing that David Hume says is that it didn't matter how long the child had looked at that ball, turning it over, looking at one side and another, it could never have inferred that when it dropped the ball, the ball would bounce. This came to it as something it couldn't expect uh, prior to experience. Now take an adult who's watching what happens at this point. 
the adult will say, well, what has happened is the child has caused the ball to bounce by dropping it. It would say the ball has a power which makes it possible for it to bounce. It might say there's a necessary connection between dropping this rubber ball and its bouncing. That is how the adult would talk. Now Hume comes along and he says, well, what has the adult got which the child doesn't have? After all, all that has really happened is that on a number of occasions, the adult has seen a ball drop and seen it bounce. In fact, it is found that this always happens as what he calls a constant conjunction. So you have two things. You first of all have somebody dropping a ball or doing something of that kind, and then you have it bouncing. But suppose it's seen this a hundred times instead of like the child only once. What difference can this make? After all, it hasn't now seen something it hadn't seen before. It hasn't seen a mysterious power in the ball. It hasn't discovered a mysterious entity called a necessary connection and some sort of peculiar property. All it has seen is various people dropping balls and the balls bouncing. And yet, in fact, the adult does believe that there's a necessary connection between the dropping of the ball and its bouncing. Well, where's this idea come from? Because for Hume, all ideas have to come from somewhere. And he says it comes from nothing except the constant experience of this constant conjunction. This works upon the mind, as he says. It forms the habit in us of expecting a ball to bounce when we drop it. But nothing more is involved than that. I could put what you've just said to us in, so to speak, abstract general terms, I think, by expressing it this way, that we can't form any conception at all of an ordered world without the idea of causal connection between things. But cause, we discover, when we try, is something that we can't actually observe. We may say that event A causes event B, but we find when we examine the situation that all we actually observe is event A followed by event B. And there isn't some third entity in the situation, a causal link between them, that we observe. And it won't do to say that, ah, oh, well, yes, but we know that event A is the cause of event B because B always and invariably follows A. Because the fact is, for example, that day always and invariably follows night, and night always and invariably follows day, but neither is the cause of the other. So we have this indispensable notion of cause, which is at the very heart of our conception of the world and of our understanding of our own experience. And yet this notion is not validated by experience or observation, and it can't be validated by logic either. And by making us aware of that, uh, Hume, it seems to me, has put his finger on a problem to which there's still no generally agreed solution. Would you agree to that? Yes, there is. People, of course, try various things, most of which Hume discusses in the treatise and gets rid of. Some will say, oh, well, nature is uniform, so if a ball bounces once, it will go on bouncing. But that's only to say that the same cause produces the same effect always, and that's exactly the thing which has to be demonstrated. Yes, he's begging the question. They're begging the question by yes. saying that. Yes. And this is true if he says, oh, well, at least it's now more probable that, that the ball will bounce than not. But all probabilities, Hume says, are really based on our experience of connections. So that this, again, is no real way out of the, of the problem. He used the same form of argument with another very fundamental question, didn't he? And that is um, the question of the self and the continuity of the self. He said that although we take it for granted that we have selves and that we are continuous selves, we discover that we can't actually locate this self in observation or experience. That when we look inside ourselves, what we actually see is individual thoughts, feelings, memories, emotions, and so on. But we don't observe some other entity, a self, that has them. Now, this is a very disconcerting and startling doctrine, isn't it? What were its implications? Well, I think one should add that Hume was never really quite satisfied with this. As you said, he kept on going back when he's giving an account of his theory to the doctrine of causality, because there he felt satisfied. He'd done what he set out to do. He'd shown that there is something about 
our character as human beings which compels us to believe that things are necessarily connected with one another, even although we don't observe in the world that necessary connection. But it gets terribly difficult when it comes to personal identity. He'd said earlier that in respect to ordinary identity, what happens is something like this. Actually, every time we close our eyes, something dis the thing in front of us disappears. It's no longer there as a perception. But when we open our eyes again, this is very rough and crude, what we see is so similar to what we saw before we close our eyes that we're confused. We treat this as having been an experience of identity we can, we, because it's so like keeping our eyes open all the time and just having a single perception. Now that's all right, perhaps, in respect to the identity of other people, you might say. It's the same sort of thing. We see them today and we see them tomorrow. They're very like one another. The actions that they perform on one occasion have certain sorts of causal connections with the ones they, uh, they uh, have on other occasions. But let's take ourselves. Now, we, we can't say that we become confused between this succession of perceptions and a strict identity, because this assumes that there's some we there all the time to become confused. And that's why Hume says, I think this is why Hume says in the long run that he's very dissatisfied with this. And this really worried him, because he'd begun from the assumption that so long as one talked only about the human mind and human perceptions, one wouldn't get into any great intellectual problems or any intellectual confusions which couldn't be easily cleared away. One thing that what he had to say about cause and what he has to say about the self have in common is that in both cases he says, let's look for the actual observation, the actual experience yes. on which this everyday right. uh, idea is based. Mm -hmm. And in each case, when we look for them, we discover to our amazement that they're not there. It's as if he's trying to base his philosophy on fact. Now, is that what he was referring to in the famous subtitle to his masterpiece, The Treatise? I've actually written it down here. He describes his treatise as an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. Was he trying to make uh, philosophy scientific? Was that his idea? Well, moral subjects, of course, he intended very broadly. He would have included under that everything we now call politics, he would have included uh, anything we would call psychology and as well as anything we would call moral philosophy. And he did want to make these more scientific in a certain sense than they had ever been. What he says is that when you approach these subjects, you find that people who usually talk seriously and take evidence into account start making wild statements without any real evidence. They start preaching at us rather than telling us what things are like. They lay down laws for us rather than looking at the facts and that we ought to look at the facts in respect to political life and human affairs just as we do in the natural sciences. There's an implied theory of language and meaning, isn't there, in, in, in this approach that we are now talking mm. about? Because uh, he very definitely thought that in order to, for a word to mean anything at all, it had to relate to a specific idea. And for an idea to have real content, it had to be derived from experience. So in effect, Hume is saying, if you want to know what a word means, look for the experience from which it's derived. If you can't find an experience or an observation from which it derives, then it doesn't mean anything. That, that, the, so there's this whole theory of meaning, is there not, underlying the philosophical approach that you've just been outlining? Yes, he draws a distinction, and he's very keen on this, although he doesn't mention it specifically very often, between talking and thinking. We're thinking only when we're operating with clear ideas which have a real source in experience. But he suggests that much of the time we're talking away and we're using what are really completely confused notions which have no real foundation in experience. If he looked at our contemporary political life and our contemporary talk, he'd find, I think, that it was full of notions which people use completely unreflectively if you ask what the foundation and experience was of, let us say, ideas like social justice or ideas like accountability, uh, you might find it extremely difficult to see what the actual factual 
situation was that these were referring what to. What they concretely what mean. What they concretely mean. And yeah. one of his main points is we should look and see what things concretely mean. You'd be absolutely horrified by much of what now passes for literary criticism, for example. That was something he was very interested in. But he thought he had to relate it very concretely to literature. And now it becomes so much of a rather bad philosophy, full of expressions, which Hume, I think, would very rapidly show, have no meaning on, on his theory of meaning. It led him to develop something that came subsequently to be known as Hume's Fork. He said of any given body of ideas that when you're approaching it for the first time, you must ask yourself two main questions. Uh, do these ideas concern matters of fact, in which case do they rest on observation and experience? Or do they concern the relations between ideas, as in mathematics and logic? If the answer to both those main questions is no, then he says, commit those writings to the flames because they can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. He was a great, as you've just said, clearer away of intellectual rubbish, uh, not only in philosophy and politics, but in religion and all sorts of other fields. Do you think that in the history of philosophy that's one of his most important uh, functions, so to speak, that he was a clearer way of illusions? I'm pretty sure about that. The other thing was that there's one particular illusion he's constantly clearing away, and that is that we can prove a great many things which we daily believe. He's constantly showing that really we cannot demonstrate even such facts as that things exist externally to us or that they continue to exist when we're not looking at them or, or again that uh, some things are necessarily connected with other things and uh, this means that he often sounds extremely skeptical and indeed he sometimes does express himself in a very skeptical way but he thinks that it's impossible for any human being to be an all and all out skeptic. Inevitably, you, you have to believe, you have to act like any other human being. And a certain measure of skepticism, what he calls mitigated skepticism, is very useful because it prevents you from falling into the trap of large ideologies, large ideas of every sort, which have no real foundation in experience. You will say to yourself, well, look, I'm not really totally able to demonstrate the sun will rise tomorrow perhaps it won't, and why should anybody that's in that position think that they can say something about the total existence of the world or some very elaborate concept of this kind? Yeah. Wouldn't it be true to say that his scepticism was not actually about the world, but about the capacities of human reason? I mean, I don't doubt for one moment that Hume just genuinely did believe that there is an independently existing world of material objects in space and time that causally interrelate to each other and that we have representations of these through our senses and that these representations are internal to us but give us an, act an accurate picture of the world around us. All that, the whole common sense view of the world, I'm sure Hume believed. But it seems to me that what he was contending was that none of this could be proved. You couldn't actually show, you couldn't prove that any of this was so. And you had to just kind of take it for granted in ordinary living. But I don't think he doubted it, did he? I don't think so. After all, it's essential to what he's saying about the possibility of constructing a theory of human nature. And he's able to say two things that this, that this will rest on. One is our awareness of ourselves, and the other is our awareness of other human beings, our experience of other human beings. Well, this does imply that human beings exist independently of us, that we're not the only being on Earth just living in a world of his own perceptions. There are other human beings, they behave in various ways, their behavior has particular effects and so on. None of this does he doubt, I think, in the most serious sense of doubting. Indeed, he'd have to be a madman to do so. But he's showing that reason can't prove it. But he's showing that what we can prove is very much less than people believe, even in the most fundamental affairs of life. So that strict proof plays a very small part in human life outside special areas like mathematics. Yeah, and he didn't even think that was all that important in human affairs, did he? Well, he really felt that the important things were, well, he says, politics, morals, literary criticism, and what he calls logic, which is a word he uses rather broadly to mean the theory of the human understanding. Anything else, the sort of thing that physicists talk about, let us say, was no doubt 
important, but at the second order, that to get a, a clear understanding of human beings and of the human understanding was indeed a necessary preliminary even to a soundly based physical science, let alone to a soundly based human science. And I think he was a person to whom what mattered essentially were human beings. Now, lots of philosophers haven't been like this. They've rather got rid of human beings or individual <laughs> human beings. But the Hume... Concerned with abstractions like time and space, Concerned with abstractions and time and space. And Hume talks about these to some degree. But basically, the human being lies at the centre of his interests. And in the old phrase, he counts nothing human alien to him. What that brings out is that in that famous subtitle to his great work, which I read earlier, an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning to moral subjects. It's not only the, the phrase, the experimental method of reasoning that's important, which everyone has always concentrated on, but the phrase moral subjects. Yes. He was applying it to everything that directly concerns human beings, that's as right. you say. In my introduction to our discussion, Professor Passmore, when I referred to Hume moving on from writing philosophy to writing history, I deliberately used the phrase, he appeared to turn away from philosophy. I didn't actually say he did, because I know that you, in your book about Hume, have argued that, in fact, in his mind, this was not a turning away at all, uh, but a continuation of the same concerns. And I'd like you to expand that a little bit. Well, I think in the first place, of course, the use of the word philosophy in its very narrow modern sense uh, is... Uh, well, as I just said, very narrow, very modern. Philosophy had a much broader sense when Hume wrote, and even later, and indeed in Cambridge, much later, physics was called natural philosophy, and subjects like economics and politics were included in moral philosophy. And that's the very broad sense of philosophy that Hume is working with. But I think there's another thing. He wrote these works, the treatise especially, he said as a necessary preliminary to working on the subjects he took to be important morals and politics, an essential preliminary. Nobody paid any real attention to them. He tried to present them in a different form, as you pointed out in your introduction, in the inquiries. People did, still didn't pay any real attention to them. And it would have been absurd for him to go on working at these. He had no real criticism of them. He was quite convinced he was right. And in terms of his own views about things, it was perfectly proper for him then to go on writing essays on politics, writing history, writing about economics, writing about the population of the ancient world, and discussing all these broad issues, literary criticism again, which he'd always regarded as central. It would have been idiotic for him to have continued all his life with what he regarded as being only preliminary to these centrally important inquiries. Because all of it was in his eyes what one might roughly call social philosophy, wasn't it? It in was. some form or in another. A, in a very broad sense, yes. it's what we would now call social philosophy. But the first part, one might very crudely call Hume's methodology of the social sciences. It ran beyond that, but it's as if a, a social scientist were to spend all his life talking about his methodology mm -hmm. and never actually doing any social science. And Hume would have felt the same way if he'd spent all his life talking about his methodology. And he says it's all the logic that's really needed is in yeah. the treatise and not gone on to do the actual work that he thinks was of the greatest consequence. Now, underlying this very broad concern with human affairs, there was a theory of human, or a conception anyway, of human nature. And you referred to that actually a few minutes ago in our discussion. Can you now bring out what that conception of human nature was? Well, it's a long story because really most of his subsequent work is a study of human nature in action in practice. But one thing he never doubted was that there was such a thing as human nature. And this is a point at which he differed from Locke. Locke had been particularly intent on getting rid of the conception of original sin. This was fundamentally important to him because he was a religious thinker as well as a, as well as a philosopher. And he had argued that human beings are born into the world with minds which are like blank sheets of paper. And then in his works on education, for example, the suggestion was that you could turn human beings in any direction you want to. And many of the later thinkers of the French Enlightenment, and really running on even to, to modern Marxism, have taken this same sort of view that at least society is the thing that makes human beings what they are. Now, Hume didn't think that. He says that he thought this was a ridiculous view, that human beings do have uh, angers, fears, all the rest of it, affections, 
which are innate, which are inborn in them, and which are constant throughout human history. Human, in different societies, they may take different forms, they, some of them may be strengthened and some weakened, but there is a permanent human nature there in which the passions are central. It's striking, I think, in most of the thinkers of this period, that they put an emphasis on passions and interests in a way in which many subsequent philosophers have not. There are, of course, important exceptions to that. Part of the basis for what he had to say about human nature being always the same was his deep learning in the classical languages, wasn't it? He, he was deeply and widely read in Greek and Latin literature uh, and history. And what struck him, one of the things that struck him about uh, those times was that human behavior in very considerable detail had been just the same 2,000 years before the time he was reading than he saw it around him as he saw it around him in his own time. Yes, he was particularly interested in writers like Cicero and in what Cicero said about human nature and human beings and human society and he felt it wasn't so different from 18th century England and that human beings were still behaving in much the same kind of way. It was the Latin writers rather than the Greek writers who particularly influenced him at that level. He constantly quoted Cicero. So that was some of the evidence that he would have given for there being a permanent human nature. But also when he writes about, let us say, the natural history of religion, it's again on the assumption that human beings have been much the same, have been faced by the same threats, the same anxieties, have had much the same ideals throughout history, even in much earlier societies than the Greek and Roman societies. It's not only an assumption, is it? I mean, he tries to demonstrate this with a great deal of factual example. He tries to demonstrate by factual example, but yeah. it is all the same, I think, uh, to some measure, something that he thinks you, you can't seriously question. Although, as I say, many yeah. subsequent writers and Locke before him have seriously questioned yeah. it. When one looks at Hume from the standpoint of our time, I think one is very struck by the sort of modernity, from our point of view, of very much of it. I mean. He was centrally concerned with this problem of the self. Well, some of the best philosophy that's been done in Britain in recent years has been about problems of the self. Uh, scientists in the 20th century have been deeply puzzled, especially uh, in their thinking about quantum physics, about the presence or absence of causal connection. And only yesterday, so to speak, the logical positivists, or at least the chief representative of logical positivism in the English-speaking world, A.J. Eyre, were constantly talking about how much they owed to Hume and how almost everything they say, Eyre is constantly saying that almost everything he has to say has previously been said by Hume. One comes up against this modernity to us again and again. And one of the 20th century problems of philosophy that he is credited with having formulated for the first time is the famous problem of induction, isn't it? That is to say that the, the logical basis on which scientific theories were traditionally said to rest. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, it's very closely related to what I said previously about causality. Go back to my baby that's dropping this ball out of the... Well, I suppose it does this on Monday and it does it on Tuesday and it does it on Wednesday and it does it on Thursday. And every time it drops the ball, the ball bounces then certainly Hume would say it comes to believe uh, that whenever it drops the ball, the ball will bounce. It, it comes to expect the ball to bounce whenever it drops it. But suppose we ask why, since all that has happened is the same thing as, uh, has occurred on many occasions, but we all know quite well that things can occur on many occasions and then on some occasion uh, they don't occur anymore. There's a change in the way things happen. You have been accustomed to relying on these regularities, but the regularity breaks down. Now, all Hume is saying is we can never be quite sure that this won't happen in respect to any regularity whatsoever. There's no way of arguing from the premises uh, that things have happened in a certain way on very many occasions in the past to the conclusion that they're bound to happen in exactly the same way in the future. And of course the point here is that every scientific law is an unrestrictedly general statement which is said to rest on a number of particular observations or experiments or instances 
and the logical link can't be made. There's a marvelous example of this in, 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 in uh, the history of philosophy itself. In logic books, in some logic books in the Middle Ages, one sentence that was used as an example was, all swans are white. Mm. And of course, for literally thousands of years, every swan that any Western man had ever seen was white. And there must have been millions of instances of white swans and not a single counterexample. But in the 18th century, when uh, Western man discovered your country, Australia, uh, for the first time, Europeans saw black swans. And it's a marvelous illustration of the fact that however many thousands or millions of times a particular thing has been observed and found to be so-and-so, it does not follow from that that the next one will be. And therefore, and this is the logically important point, no finite number of specific observations can ever logically entail an unrestrictedly general or universal conclusion. But all scientific laws are of that character, and therefore they are not logically entailed by the observations that are supposed to be their basis. And this is an explosive insight, isn't it? I mean, it seemed to people to knock away the foundations of science as they understood it. Yes, I think it's more and more widely agreed by scientists themselves that scientific propositions are in some measure hypothetical. And many very firmly based ones have been overthrown in the past. People used to say that Einstein didn't overthrow Newton. He simply uh, produced a more general theory of which Newton's theory is part. But that's not really true. There are some things that Newton said that have now been shown to be false. And Newton was for a long time the supreme example of a, a kind of certain demonstrative science. Bertrand Russell, in his famous book, A History of Western Philosophy, uh, after he's said something about Hume's doctrines on these various fundamental things that we've considered, uh, the cause and effect relationship, the nature of the self, the inductive basis for scientific laws, Russell then goes on to say that in many of these respects we still haven't got beyond Hume, that he pointed out very fundamental problems that no one has yet solved. This is true, of course, it's equally true that Plato pointed out very fundamental <laughs> questions that nobody has yet solved. So unfortunately, it's much easier in, in uh, philosophy to uh, ask questions and to raise difficulties than to produce solutions. But I think one crucial thing about Hume is the questions he asked, and I think this is also true of Plato, were very fundamental ones, so that we can say that if a person doesn't take Hume's question seriously, he can't really be counted as a philosopher. Yes, these are absolutely fundamental to what philosophy is, aren't they? Yes, these they are questions. fundamental issues. They're not the only issues which are fundamental, mm. but they are fundamental issues. Mm. What sort of a man was he? I get the impression when I read his work, and I've been rereading it for this discussion just recently, I get the impression of a kind of massive humaneness which is enormously attractive. Yes, I, you know, his friend Adam Smith said he came as near to perfection in these sort of respects as any human being possibly could. And biographers have explored his life in great detail. I don't think any of them have found a single example of a mean or a malicious action. He's occasionally a bit timid. Well, not unnaturally. He had views about religion which uh, were scarcely popular in the society in which he was living. He's occasionally a little bit vain, but this is a form I of uh, sin, if it is that, which I can easily forgive. But he doesn't ever act meanly or maliciously. And I'm quite sure that if there was a sort of celestial philosopher's party, a dinner party, it's David Hume I would want to sit next to. Yes. I, I think in many ways Plato was the greater philosopher, but it's David Hume I would want to sit next to. And I think almost everybody else would. He had this warm humanity. He was without pretensions. He was a man of very considerable personal courage. He was dying of cancer in his last years. He still received his friends as usual. He knew or believed he knew that he was certainly not immortal, but this didn't disturb him in the least. It very much disturbed Boswell when Boswell interviewed him towards the end. But he managed to retain that sort of equanimity and, and moderation and cheerfulness, which was his own ideal. Yes. And his style has had great influence, hasn't it? I mean, I mentioned earlier in this discussion two 20th century 
British philosophers, both of them famous, A.J. Eyre and Bertrand Russell, who have been consciously influenced by the Hume way of doing things, and there have been many others. Yes, well, he did place this great emphasis on clarity and indeed on elegance. I recently heard clarity and elegance referred to as old-fashioned virtues, which nobody now attempts. Uh, but certainly Eyre and Russell attempted them, and certainly Hume attempted them. And he set a certain pattern of British philosophizing in which one tries to be clear, one tries to be critical, one tries not to make large assumptions, one tries to look all the while at what one's doing in a critical spirit, and one tries to tie it up to what actually happens in the world. Hume's approach does raise one uh, important difficulty, doesn't it? You refer to the fact that he stresses that most of the things that we take for granted we don't actually know and can't prove, can never prove. Uh, that being so, how are we to distinguish between the sort of view that it's reasonable to hold and the sort of view that it's unreasonable to hold? What then becomes the criterion of uh, a reasonable man's belief? This is a very difficult question. At times, Hume seems to be saying nothing more than that, well, in general, it's much more sensible to rely on constant conjunctions than on mere chance. He gives rules for judging of cause and effect. At other times, he seems to suggest there's really no answer to this question. But that is something that I think would satisfy nobody. And one might say that is the principal problem that Hume set. I referred to it in a way a little while ago. Uh, we agree, let us say, that uh, scientific laws are not demonstrable in the strict sense. Why, however, is it still far better to depend on these in our practical affairs of life than in some silly idea that someone thinks up in a bestseller? See, I think that what Hume had to say about all this is very germane to the ideas about science that most people have today in the 20th century. My impression is that most people, including most well-educated people, have the idea of science that it consists of a body of known, demonstrated, proved certainties, and that the growth of science consists in adding new certainties to the body of already existing ones. Anybody who has that view of human knowledge or that view of science really has a very fundamental lesson to learn from Hume, don't they? I mean, Hume retains his full power to disconcert today, doesn't he? Yes, Hume is an extremely disconcerting thinker. I think it's uh, still true in respect to science that science does make certain. There's all sorts of things we know about the world we didn't know before scientists got going, but certainly when a lot of people, for example, think of science as something where there's no room for the imagination at all. They imagine you, they believe that you have all sorts of need for the imagination if you're writing a novel or writing a play, but when you're doing a science, it's just a question of going into a laboratory and seeing what happens. Now this is nonsense. Any kind of scientific work above the, the most trivial is an enormous feat of the imagination. If you take contemporary cosmology, for example, it's, uh, well, this is admittedly a, a very extreme example, but it's an extraordinary imaginative feat. And the same is true of things like DNA, genetics, any of the great discoveries require not merely careful work in laboratories, though this is essential, and careful thinking at all levels, but also a capacity to make imaginative leaps. And it's interesting that in Hume, the idea of the imagination constantly re-emerges as a being of central importance. The imagination, he thinks, is essential to all our thinking about the world. Even in what we call our perception of facts, there is always an element of the imagination at work. And the centrality of the imagination is one of the things I find most fascinating in David Hume. It's directly germane to what you've just said that the greatest of all 20th century scientists, Einstein, once said, he said in 1928, I remember, he made the remark that he would never have dared to overthrow the science of Newton had he not read Hume. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, finish our discussion, really, by asking you to say a little more about the influence of Hume on major thinkers subsequent to him. He did, you've already referred to his influence on Kant, who I think most philosophers would regard as the greatest of all philosophers since Hume. Uh, what was his influence on Kant? Well, I think that Kant uh, 
unlike the British critics of Hume, really did see what Hume was about. He saw he had to do philosophy in a quite different kind of way. And if he was going, as he wanted to do, to answer Hume, and particularly to get rid of what he took to be the sceptical elements in Hume, he had to say that really our perception of the world is of a quite different kind from the sort of thing that Hume and his predecessors had taken it to be. We don't, as Hume always presumes, have isolated perceptions simply following one another. We are from the beginning aware of things as being causally connected, causally linked with one another. One gets in Kant, however, a great emphasis on the creative power of the mind as well. The suggestion that this yeah. order is in part imposed by the mind, and that leads in a direction that you wouldn't have liked. It leads in the direction of subsequent German idealism, in the direction of writers like Hegel. But Kant did see, didn't he, that if you started with empiricist assumptions, Hume then posed problems that, on empiricist assumptions, you couldn't answer. That was his view. And Kant's solution was to reject the assumptions and, and start a wholly new approach. He does see, I think, the essential thing, that if you begin from the position that what we're aware of are isolated events, whether they're in our own mind, whether they're perceptions, or on the surface of our skin, or in the world, you cannot create out of them, simply as your soul material, the kind of ordered world which, in fact, we experience in our daily life. Well, to continue the discussion beyond this point would take us into a discussion of Kant, so I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Passmore. Good, thank you. <laughs>